Good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you are in this world. And welcome to today's special. We have a very special um, setting priorities for 2020. And today, uh, my name is Roshan Tirin, and I'm going to be walking you through some of the key trends for 2022 for HR leaders. And tomorrow, we have other special guests, uh, followed by another session on Thursday. We will be starting at 11 a.m. sharp. So uh, we will see you guys shortly. In the meantime, enjoy this little video before we kick off our session at 11 a.m. See you guys shortly. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. Today we will be having a special session um, on setting priorities for 2020 and uh, this is a three-day program uh, starting today and I'll be your sort of speaker for today sharing a little bit about trends for 2020 specifically for the learning and engagement space and the HR community and this will be followed by a couple of other sessions uh, including some prominent global speakers who will be sharing what you should be thinking about for 2020. Now, without further ado, I will be sharing a couple of my slides and I will be talking a little bit about trends um, for 2022, what we should be looking forward to um, and what we should be watching out for. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the world that we are in at this point in time also. What does it mean to move from normal to this so-called new normal that is currently what uh, people sort of talk a little bit about. Um, and, and, and as always, I'm very glad to welcome Husni. Thank you for being part of all of our programs. Uh, great to see you there. Um, and of course, Dr. Prakash, uh, great to also have you joining us today. And um, as others stream in, uh, we look forward to sharing some of a little bit of insights in terms of what we can look forward to for 2022 um, and specifically what we need to be uh, 
thinking about 2022, uh, not 2020, uh, Abdul Shukur. So we're going to talk about 2022, right? Uh, all, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of rolls for off the tongue, right? All right. So with that, let me jump into uh, a couple of things uh, when we talk again. It's 2022, right? Uh, so let's 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 jump right into this. You know, I I, I spent um, most of my career actually uh, running businesses. Um, in, 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 in General Electric, in NBC, uh, in, especially in our, our financial services division uh, of GE. And then I, I spent the next number of years really getting into the human resource space. And then finally, uh, I'm back to running businesses, but a human resource sort of a business uh, after a couple of years with Johnson & Johnson uh, and, and a number of other organizations. Um, you know, and one of my most profound experiences was really the experience I had running the aviation business when I came back to Malaysia and we took a shop that was really one of the worst performing shops in the world. Um, really, really bad turnaround times, really product, low productivity and worse still, probably one of the most underperforming entities, you know, with losses, uh, with huge staggering losses. Um, and we took that entity and made it into the world's best overhaul shop in the world, right? Um, so that, 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 that was an achievement, you know, taking a, a Malaysian company and within two years, making it the best overall shop in the world. And not only that, that was in 2001, right, when we succeeded in becoming one of the most highly productive, um, profitable, and, 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 and really most efficient shop in the world. But you fast forward to 2017, you know, uh, uh, when, we, when, I, when I went to visit the shop again, uh, again, you know, the, the, the revenues had gone tenfold. Um, it had grown even bigger, and you had the biggest, best airlines in the world sending their engines to this shop to be overhauled. So something, some, you know, so I learned a lot of lessons in terms of transformation, in terms of change, in terms of how do you take an uh, environment, which was essentially a GLC, a government-linked company that we bought over, um, and transform it. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of these things when we come to talk about 2022. So when you look at 2022, right, this world is just beyond us, and, and many of us, are full of hope, just like we were at the end of 2020 uh, and the start of 2021. We said, oh, this is going to be a hopeful year. You know, we'll see the end of COVID and we will be very, very excited um, uh, about, about, um, about what's happening. And I see, uh, you know, Eva saying, I can't, you know, can't wait to hear about HR trends, but I'm going to pause for a bit because before we get into HR trends, we need to understand what's happening in the world a little bit. And I'm going to take you through a journey of understanding what's happening in the world. And then we'll get into HR. And, and what I, wanna, I want to share a little bit is about understanding the context of our age. Um, and this, this, is, this is something, you know, I, I really want to share because, you know, something very close to my heart. Um, you know, when I started looking at this era, um, 1990s, 2000, 2010s, and now 2020s, and we move into this decade, right? You know, I started to look and find a lot of similarities that we had to the 1890s, about 120 years ago, 130 years ago. In the 1890s, and there's this famous uh, uh, philosopher, I guess, Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, a lot of people talk about Nietzsche. Uh, but, but he talks about something very interesting called the sixth sense. And, and Nietzsche is, is, is interesting because in the 1890s, uh, he, he, he kind of said, look, this is a great time of growth and this is a great time of innovation, right? There's a lot of growth and innovation happening in this time. And, and, and he wasn't wrong, right? Because if you think about what was happening at that time, it was... Oh, um, unbelievable growth, right? There was cars, there was aeroplane in 1903, the, 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 the Orville and Wilbur Wright, you know, set up the aeroplane and, and we had flight for the first time in human history, humans could fly. We had electricity with Thomas Edison, with the telephone, with Alexander Graham Bell and all the innovation that AT&T and others started to navigate in the early 1900s. Um, and we, it was really an amazing time. But what he said is that, you know, there's, you know, there's going to be a problem in this world. And this is what, Frederick Nietzsche said, he said, you need the sixth sense. He said, most of us have five senses. What we are missing is the sixth sense. And what Nietzsche's idea of a sixth sense was this. He said that you need to develop a feel of current, a current feel of history. You know, what are the currents of history telling you? What is the present moment telling you? And all these things must be played on in a larger historical context. And he said, if we don't understand, if we don't have the sixth sense, what's going to happen if all the people in this world, in the 1890s, 1900s, and 1910s, if they don't have the sixth sense, this will lead to a time of turbulence, crisis, and war because there's going to be a displacement. And so, you know, when I, when I start to look at it and I start to understand, you know, the 1890s and the 1920s, it was truly a time of great innovation. 
aeroplane, light bulbs, telephone, cars, radio with Marconi and other things. It was a time of hyper growth. Exponential growth was happening. Economy was growing. Productivity was growing. Consumerism with, with Ford and Henry Ford and, and some of the things that he was postulating. All these things were, were creating hyper growth. But it was also a very confusing time. There was a lot of displacement because ecosystems were being shifted, right? I mean, so, so think about it. You know, we, we have cars that were replacing horses and roads were meant for horses. Um, and suddenly you have to build roads for cars, you have to build highways, you have to, there, there were change in jobs because I, I used to, you know, you, 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 you have drivers now of cars, uh, which is a very different job, right? Uh, from carriage drivers in, in, in horses, you have, you have uh, and, and the things that they do, um, there was confusion about roads, there was confusion about environment. And all these things in the 1890s to the 1920s caused a time of destruction because a lot of things that were the old way of living because of industrialization, because of all the changes, had to be destroyed and reconstructed again. And cities were completely reconstructed. I mean, you think about New York City and, and all these cities, they, they, they all had you know, cabling for, 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 for telephone lines uh, was going on, electricity, you know, all that cabling was creating significant changes in the world. Now fast forward to 1990. And I remember the 1990s relatively well. You know, we started to see the, the, the start of the, the, the technology boom. We started to see the, the, the rise of the internet, a, a democratization that happened in the, across the world with the, the, the 89, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall, and, and 1990 with all the, 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 the changes that were happening with, with driving uh, a freedom and liberties. You know, it was, it was a different era, right, where people were thinking, okay, this is an era of, 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 of personal freedom. Right? not to be bound by kings and environments and, and, and politics of the land, right? all these things. And that led to technology changes, that led to the, to, to the internet boom you know, uh, that, that crossed what we call apps and, and, and telco changes with, with the iPhone and, and, and what Android and, and Google and all these things happened. You know, very much the same as the 1890s. And what Nietzsche says is that you need a sixth sense. You need people who understand the age. Because if you don't understand the currents of history, you don't understand the changes that are taking place, you don't understand the environment, you won't be able to play in the context of the age. And it will cause displacement, it will cause changes, and it will cause significant issues. Now, I think about the, 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 the biggest threat to humanity in the 19th century was pneumonia because of urbanization that was caused because of the huge population move from, from the rural areas to, 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 the, to the urban areas. 20th century was cancer because of new materials with industrialization, with plastics. In 21st century, we just don't understand, right? You know, people talk about mental health, spiritual diseases. And I think if we don't understand the age that we are in, we cannot lead, we cannot teach, we cannot develop people, we cannot coach, we cannot truly be able to play in the context of the age. So, so as we come to 2022, I want us to take a step back before we understand the trends of HR to understand that we need to understand the context of it. So we, we, talk about, we talk about the Industrial Revolution. We talk about the fourth Industrial Revolution. And we say, oh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a digital revolution. But it's not just a digital revolution, right? It's also a physical revolution. It's also a biological revolution. It's significant changes that are happening in, in, this, in this world, right? Significant changes right and and you know oh it's a digital revolution but it's not digital it's digital iot blockchain it's also physical you got 3d printing your autonomous vehicles your robotics your new materials all these things are physical changes that are changing manufacturing changing the way we do things 3d printing will make manufacturing uh, personalized manufacturing right but then we also have biological changes that are happening significant genome the genome mapping project right is driving predictive medicine right Right? Predictive. I can predict that you're going to get sick in 20 years, right? You know, David Sinclair and some of the, the amazing. I mean, I'm 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 so mesmerized by what David Sinclair is doing with with lifespan, right? It's and and what he calls health span, right? How do we move people to 120 years, 150 years, 200 years? You know, our bodies are meant to live for 500 years, maybe, right? In in the old times, in biblical times, I think you, you can live to 800 binaries. And he's saying, yeah, we, we our bodies are built to do that, right? But we just don't understand the the the, the changes and so many different permutations are happening. Now, all this with, with IR4 is driving not just uh, uh, changes, but also another big influencer is COVID, right? We, 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 you know, if you, if you have customers that have to, the way we manage customers is different. The way we engage employees, and empower employees is different. The way we optimize operations, the way we transform products, everything is different. 
And so, so you, you, you start to you pause, right? And, and just pause and, and reflect. Take, take, take a breath, right? And, and, you know, any of you at any point in time, you have comments, you have thoughts. I just love to hear what you are thinking. But, but what I want you to start to think about is as you think about the changes that are happening in the space, right? You start to think about, hey, what is this world that we're going to be playing in in 2022? What do I need to do in 2022? And, and the worst part is there's security issues, right? Everything, you know, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that, right? Because the, because of all these changes has created very, very weird workplace, a very volatile where there's rapid rates of change, a very uncertain workplace. So many things are unclear. We're so unclear about everything. Sometimes business models, sometimes the way we to sell our product or go to a market approach, sometimes the way we empower and manage our employees, how do we manage them? There's so much complexity. There's so many different levels of levers and levels of decision makers. There's so much ambiguity. There's so many unknown factors. There's so many variables, right? And, and it's created what we call a very simple workplace, Right, which was in the eighteen, uh, sorry, nineteen eighties when I when I started, you know, <laughs> the workplace. Nineteen eighties, you know, you got fax machine, you got no emails. It was just simple. Became a bit more complicated with emails. Became a little bit more complex, and then today we've got a very chaotic workplace from a very ordered line to a very unordered workplace, and and it's all driven by so many different permutations that have been hitting us left, right, and center. Right. And so what does this mean for us as we look at 2022, as we budget for 2022, as we plan for 2022, as we, as we look at employees, how do we engage them? How do we empower them? How do we enable them? As we look at customers, how do we engage with them? How do we sell to them? How do we uh, and, and, and establish that, that, that connection, that, that bond, uh, that relationship with them, right? All these things have changed. And COVID, right? has completely changed the way we even look at our organization. Before, when you look at transformation, you always looked at two points. The best time, I remember I worked at GE and we always talked about transformation when we are about to mature in terms of our product or when we're in a crisis. Those were two pockets of transformation. But with COVID, everybody has become a crisis company. I remember we, we went through our crisis a, a year ago and we completely transformed how we looked at things and how we... And today, you know, lockdown... Uh, or otherwise, you know, no problem, right? Uh, we, we figured it out, right? But every company has somewhat looked at transformation as, as a need, not as, a, as something that, oh, we, you keep it at a point in time. It's a consistent thing. We need to consistently pivot. We need to consistently transform. We need to consistently recover. We need to consistently grow and consistently change um, the things that we're doing. So, so COVID has really changed the landscape. And I think the first lesson that I want to share is that as HR professionals, I think the first biggest thing we must not just own, we must embody in the things that we do is that we must embrace change, right? And, and this is motherhood, right? Okay, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to go deeper a little bit and talk a little bit more in terms of not just the motherhood piece, but also, also get down to some of the nitty gritty um, of, of, of the pieces. And, you know, as always, I said, look, if there are uh, uh, comments, uh, please uh, um, uh, share them. You know, I, I always love uh, what uh, Albert Einstein says in Sanity, doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. And, and we know that changes that happen. But as HR, as the HR function, it continues to be doing the same thing over and over and over, right? And, and you know, we, we've seen all these quotes, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Um, so as we talk about 2022 and, and we get to this setting priorities for 2022, we must understand we must own change. And it's not just HR professions. I think everybody needs to own change, right? So let, let's talk a little bit about this change, right? And I want to talk a little bit about the transformation that's happening in the HR function. And it's not just about technology, right? It's all the other pieces. It's about displacement. It's just like in the 1890s to the 1920s. What happened in the 1920s is World War I and then the Great Depression and then World War II. And then in 1945, you suddenly see a time of relatively peace because people have finally figured out how to navigate. And, and you look at this time, right? We, we are, we are heading towards the same direction, right? We are heading towards that same sort of ecosystem where potentially if we don't manage displacement, we don't manage employees understanding the nature of the age, if we don't understand what we are playing in, we're going to waste our time on a whole bunch of things. You know, many times I look at HR budgets and, and, and I say, oh, it's about HR administration, it's about talent acquisition, it's about learning, it's about this, about that. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think a lot of it is absolutely bollocks, right? Because it's really ultimately about how do you drive 
the right initiatives for this era, for this new age that we are talking about. All right, so let me let me jump into what this really means. So I'm going to talk very quickly about the evolution of HR. Right? So HR started, you know, many years ago as a as an administrator. So okay, you're an administrator, and you take out payroll in the nine in the 1890s. You know, when 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 organizations first started to move 1990s, 1900s, and then you know somewhere in the 1930s, 1940s, you saw you know a couple of a guy say, you know, HR needs to become a functional expert. We need to look at manpower planning. We need to we need to look at at at, at a couple of key processes, hiring, um, and and so on. And, and so our title sort of changed, right? HR started as payroll manager and then they moved as a you know manpower uh, you, you see the hr titles start manpower planning or manpower uh, a vp manpower and so on and so forth you, you hear all these titles and then somewhere in the 1980s 1990s you know you say hey, hey hr needs to be part of the table hr is a business leader you know and hr needs to become a strategist you know just like all the other functions you know where the finance person is a strategist and the, and the it person is a strategist hr too and it's about strategic imperatives like succession planning and people management and people strategy and, and, and driving that. And I, I think there's another evolution of HR, right? And, 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 and we saw that in the probably in the last five to eight years, right? We saw HR move to become a business leader, right? Um, where HR, you know, it, there, there's a push to say, hey, HR must not look at it as an internal function, but we need to look at HR as an outside. And what does that mean? A business leader is like, you know, usually, HR is very internal. We look at customers and we look at employees and we say, okay, we need Mr. Kale. No, sorry, we look at, sorry, <laughs> my got it wrong. We look at we look at employees and line managers. We don't even look at customers, right? Uh, we, we say, hey, let's look at employees and line managers. Line managers is, is our managers in our business and our employees. We take care of them. And that's what HR does. But to be a value creator, you must also understand what the customer is thinking. You must also understand what the regulators want. You must understand what investors want for your organization. You must understand what the community wants. And ultimately, you need to understand what the ecosystem or the vendors and the dealers and the, and the partners that bring to your organization. And only when you see things from outside and then you bring it in and you say, okay, I understand what all these people want. And then I bring it in to my line managers and say, this is what I need to do to develop you, to enable you, to empower you, to engage with you. If I don't understand what the environment is telling me, I won't be able to give the right things to my employees and my line leader. So we have always been very internal. We ask our employees, employees, what do you want? Oh, we need to, it's like almost a doctor, right? A doctor says, hey, uh, to the patient, hey patient, what's wrong with you? Oh, I got a headache, and here's what I need: I need a Panadol, I need this, I need that, and maybe you know, give me a, a, a bit of that that Lipitor. I like that, right? And you say, okay, here you go, right? And and no doctor works like that, right? Because the doctor will talk to you about your symptoms, but ultimately, the doctor is the one who prescribes medicine, right? But we've become so accustomed to listening to our employees and our line for everything, not just for the symptoms, but also for the cure, that we forgot to say, hey, the input shouldn't come from internal; the input should come from outside, right? And to me, that's, that's a big thing that is changing the HR space is we need to be value creators. And how can you be, how do you get access to this input? How do you get access to this understanding? To me, the biggest role of HR in 2022 and onwards is to be playing the intelligence business. HR needs to be a player in the intelligence business. What does that mean? It means you need, just like, if, if you think of marketers, right? You know why marketers have evolved? In the, the marketing function is so, so evolved today, right? Um, and, 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 you know, I, I say a quick comment coming in from someone. Uh, Hi, Roshan, if 2020 brings another surprise, hopefully not. Fingers crossed, we will most likely need to rethink our priority. I'm sure we will figure it out. But does this cause a mental fatigue within an organization that creates another problem? Yep, absolutely. And we'll talk about your question in a bit, Sashi. So th thanks for your question. And, and feel free to shoot out questions. I will take them uh, as we go uh, along. But, you know... One of the biggest problems uh, in, in, in HR is that we don't understand what our real function is. And to me, we are in the intelligence business. We're in the employee intelligence business. Just like marketing is in the customer intelligence business. So marketing understands the customer to the end point, right? They understand hotspots. They understand which custom, word customer likes. They understand, you know, everything about the customer and they're able to then propose understanding how to get them the right product at the right time, the right place. Now, HR needs to be a player in the intelligence space. They need to understand everything about employees, what the employee does, what the employee likes, what the employee dislikes, what the employee, uh, you know, when the employee is the most productive, when the employee is least productive, what the employee needs to learn, how the employee learns best, and be able to enable the employees to be empowered, to be engaged, to be, uh, to be loved, 
to feel uh, as part of a team, uh, to be executing well, to be efficient. And that's really what the core function of HR is. I mean, at least to me, if you get this right, you set yourself up for 2022. And so what does that mean? It means that you need to have very deep understanding of capability, what we have to do, capability intelligence. And you can't. Right? There's no way you can understand deep capability unless you have built technology into your HR processes. Now, when you have capability intelligence, you understand each individual, then you're able to identify who the talent are. And then you're able to match the talent to the transactions. If you have talent intelligence, you're able to say, I need to, I have these transactions that needs to be achieved or these imperatives or these business uh, uh, goals that needs to be, to be taken care of. I get my right talent because I understand I have capable intelligence. I now have talent intelligence. I'm able to get the right talent for the right transaction. And ultimately, you're able to enable the organization to drive change through projects, right? And that can only be done when you have deep understanding of technology. So let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, technology and what it means. So, so to me, the starting point is how do you get, uh, how, how do you get that intelligence? You know, when, when you, especially if you talk about the learning space, I'm going to zoom into the learning space a little bit. So you need to put the right systems in place. You need to put the right technology that gives you the employee intelligence. Now, the other thing you need to think about is you need to have very clear business understanding. You need to be very clear what the business strategy is. Because if you are ultimately going to achieve business outcome, which is the goal, right? and you are going to build a future-ready workforce, you must have very deep understanding of your business. What is my business doing? What its goal is? And you must also have very deep understanding of your people, right? Now, by enabling you to have deep understanding of people and deep understanding of your business, you are then able to say, what sort of curriculum, what sort of learning calendar, what sort of discipline, infrastructure, methodological learning curriculum can you embed that enables your, your employees when they have gaps to be upskilled so that they can execute the business strategy. And when they have the right skills, the right capability, the right mindsets, the right behaviors, they are able then to get you the business outcomes. So you don't do, when you, when you, when you, when you drive a learning calendar, it's not about training them based on gaps on what the business line manager, or this guy cannot talk, uh, sending for second communication skills. How is that related to achieving the business strategy of the business imperatives and ultimately to achieving the business outcome? Everything has to be outcome driven. And so, you know, very, very simply, right? You, your business has some goals. Now your employees are here, right? And you say, okay, my employees are here. I need to get them here. And then the following year, get them here. And over the next three, five years, we will achieve our business imperatives and our strategic priority work streams, right? And, and you, you got to say, you know, what are the new mindsets that I need to move to move here? What are the new behaviors that I need to enable to move here? What are the people capabilities that I need to get to move them here? Now, all these things are related because you move them here because this is kind of your organizational goal for next year, 2022 and, and 2023 and the 2024. And ultimately in 2025, we, we, we achieve our three-year, five-year plan, right? So our role is to build a curriculum and, and understand the mindsets, behaviors, and, and capability of what I call MBS, the mindsets, behaviors, and skills right, that are needed to enable you to achieve the business goal. And it has to be business specific. It cannot be, oh, this is a nice program, or this is a nice intervention. You know, It has to be related to your business. So that's, that's my first point. Now, the second thing is, so my first point is you have to be business specific in terms of building your 2022 uh, agenda. The second point is related to confidence. Now, many times, um, many companies, the leaders cannot execute, the employees cannot execute, not because they don't have the knowledge and skill. They have the knowledge, they have the skill. We hire people with knowledge and skill, but they just don't have the confidence. So somebody uh, is very good at riding the bicycle, but because they had an accident a couple of years ago, they're very scared of riding the bicycle. And so what happened is that because they're scared of riding a bicycle, they, they, they don't have the confidence. They don't want to execute. They don't want to ride a bicycle. But their job is to ride a bicycle. And, how, and, and our job is to give them the confidence. Hey, you can do it. You can do this. You can do this. Right? So the first part is you must be aligned to the business. Second part is you need to figure out how to build confidence into your design and your philosophy for learning and development. Now, I see a question uh, from Husni. And, and yeah, I'll take this right away. Um, should HR then be a profit center instead of a cost center in order to be in line with the value creator? Maybe. Right? But I think... I think, um, Husni, I think what's going to happen is we won't see 
HR, IT, finance in the future. I, my, my firm belief is that, you know, as we understand the wisdom of the age, if you go back 300 years ago, you, you don't, and, and, and if you start, a start okay, let's say when you first start up a company, when I first started a company, so I started this company with Hui Ming, um, and the two of us started up. Now we, she, she, we are both HR people. I'm sort of, you know, I, I've, I've done a finance and so on, and she has to. So we, we didn't say, okay, you take care of finance, you take care of this IT, and I'll take care of this. And no, we're like, okay, the first thing is, we got two things we want to do. First is, we must build a product, and then we must sell the product, and then we must hold on to our customer. That's it, right? So we, 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 get a, we, we, we have to get a customer, and we have to keep the customer and delight the customer. That's it. So we said, look, I will get the customer. You will delight the customer, <laughs> right? So we just split it. And it's very simple, right? There's no HR. There's no finance IT. And if you think of all startups, it's like that. Now, over time, right, we start to say, okay, we need to scale this. So we need segregation. But I think in the future, we'll see a mismorph of, you, you'll see functions start to intertwine, right? Because everybody, technology cannot be a function by itself. Technology is embedded in every single function, right? Um, you know, so you, you may look at finance and say, you know, finance, we need accounting. Yeah, maybe, uh, but maybe it will morph to something more, right? Um, so I, will, I see functions sort of dilute and morph uh, into each other and we'll have super functions uh, or super sort of uh, uh, enablers, right? Um, and HR is an enabler, finance is an enabler. Uh, we will start to look at the enabling function sort of in, in a collective, uh, at least that's my, my, my take on it. Uh, uh, so yeah, I'm not sure if that answers you, but I think at some point in time, it's not, and I think that the way of thinking profit center or not, is it's kind of thinking about the industrial way of running companies, right? I think, you know, because of the infrastructure change, just think about horses to cars, we have to change roads, we have to put petrol stations. You know, last time with horses, we got petrol stations and Rockefeller said, oh, petrol or, or gas, is all, in, all in gas is going to be great. So I'm going to buy up all the, so billionaires started to, to say, how can I own the networks, the, the petrol network or the, the oil and gas? Because with highways, with petrol, this is a complete infrastructure change which Eisenhower and, and the U.S. did the, were the very first to do that, right? In the, in, in the 40s when Eisenhower started to build all these highways and petrol stations and so on. It's the same thing, right? When we start to look at the company for the 21st century, it's going to be evolving to something we don't, we, we not necessarily is going to look like what it is today with HR and IT and finance and, and supply chain and this and that. I, I, I think it will morph to something very different. Again, Husni, I, I'm, hopefully I've, I've answered your question. So, so let's go back to the confidence piece. So confidence, it's about enabling somebody to be able to be given that confidence. And that doesn't happen by sitting in a classroom. That happens when you blend in some experiential, blend in technology, blend in and, and embed digital classroom experiential and journeys in, in a consolidated approach. And, and I, I can share more in a bit. Now, the last, the last piece, so my, my, you know, again, three points I'm going to make. My last piece is about understanding your people. So you understand that there are some people who's going to learn very fast in your organization. Let's just call them the high post. They just learn things very fast. You know, you tell them something, they pick it up. Now, there are some people, they take a bit more time, but they'll get there, you know. They will learn, maybe they'll take five years to learn to move to the next level. You know, these guys may take two, and then maybe they take another, you know, eight years to move to this level, and then maybe another 10 years, and so on and so forth. But they get there, they get there, but they, they, they learn in an incremental manner. And then there's some people who just don't want to learn. Like, it's like, forget it, I'm checked out. I, I, I just so, so now the approach, your approach must be differentiated. And this is where technology comes in, is to identify, and, and there's so many things like ABA and other things, to identify you know, who's this hypo, who's this incremental guys, and who are the guys that are not learning, right? And, 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 you know, uh, and if you want to know for yourself, I, I'll get some of our producers put a link to ABA. You can just go there and, and, and download the ABA traits and do the test and understand, you know, what sort of gaps do you have um, in your own. Uh, and, and so once you understand that, then you say, okay, for these guys, I shouldn't be teaching them in classroom. I need to accelerate them. I need to give them accelerated learning. For these guys, I need to give them sort of incremental learning. And finally, for these guys, I don't need to teach them, you know, I need to coach them in or coach them out, right? So again, you know, it's, it's, it's about being aligned to your business goals, number one. It's about being very clear in terms of building elements of, you know, in your philosophy, build elements of self-confidence, build elements of, of capability, uh, ex, uh, motivation, and so on. And the last one is cater separately for different people. You got a learning calendar, maybe it's here. You got hypo programs, maybe it's here. You know, your, 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 your Nicole accelerators. I mean, those are fantastic for hypo accelerations, right? So, you know, figure out, you know, how you want to get, get your Nicole accelerators here, but then you can use the Nicole core learning modules here. So, so be differentiated in the way you, you, you cater for your people. 
And you will see, you know, because people will grow in different levels, right? Some people will take 26 years to get to the 6 level. Some will take 15. So they need accelerator programs, not, not one-off, you know, uh, incremental learning programs, right? And so, you know, I, I'm going to, you know, kind of move to the engagement piece in a bit. But, you know, when we talk about learning, you're talking about transferable skills, contextual skills. It's so important, right? Because it's the context of the line. Moment of need skills. That means at this moment, I got this problem. I just need the skill at this point in time. And ultimately, you need engagement. You need that motivation. You need the self-confidence. And you need to create a culture that provides this self-confidence, right? So I'm going to, I'm gonna you know, get into the engagement piece, piece in a bit. But I'm just going to make sure I take a couple of questions, uh, if there are any questions. And, and Husni, uh, thanks for uh, uh, your questions. You know, keep them coming. Uh, so for those who want to check out ABA, this is a great tool, very, very cheap, I think. Um, I think it's less than 20 US dollars and see if there's a promo code we can we can, we can uh, uh, give you. Uh, but, but it's a fantastic tool, right, uh, for you to sort of uh, be able to leverage that. So let me come into the engagement space. And then I'll, let me share a little bit about our, my, my own tran our own transformation journey um, and, and move from there. Um, so, you know, I, I, I share a bit of our journey. And one of the things I think is very interesting is that, you know, we, we, when we set up Lira Mix, it's about fixing the world. Uh, we said, look, uh, we, we, Malaysia is so messed up, still is, right? <laughs> and we said, how do we fix? fix? How do we? And, 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 and we had an idea. Uh, it's, like, we, it's about leadership, right? So if we can take one person, Right, take one person and make them into a better leader. Take one person and make them into a better leader. Now, what happens is that leader will lead a community. They will lead a company. They will lead an NGO. They will lead a, a, a school. They will lead a, 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 a Rukunta Tanga, whatever it is. They will lead something. And when they lead, because they are a better leader, the community becomes better. And you have many, 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 many communities, right? At some point in time, Malaysia will be transformed because of the transformation that comes from communities. And all came because of better leadership, right? And that was a dream. But how do we scale up, right? So we started a couple of years ago and, you know, we started in 2008 with one, one country and then we had a couple of things as a product and you know, we were very youth uh, dominated. Today, we are in about eight, nine countries and, and we've grown. But one of the things that we realized is that at some point in time, we realized that there were gaps. And, and this happened in, in 2016, you know. When, 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 uh, when, I, when I was teaching IMD and, and one of the professors there, you know, Michael Wade, sort of came to me and said, Roshan, you, you, you've got to relook at the world is changing and you, you cannot be just postulating you know, a training and or leadership development that is based on what it was in the past. You need to start learning how things have changed. And so in 2019, we took an opportunity to relook at ourselves and we said, look, our goal is to solve two problems. One is to solve the learning problem. The other one is to solve the engagement problem, you know, so these were the two problems that we wanted. And so what was the problem in the learning space? And so we said the learning space, and, and this might be, it's that over time, you know, in the old days, uh, it's very high context, con context, right? That means if you're an apprentice, you're a fisherman, you're, you're a whatever, right? You're a bookmaker, you're anything, right? There's a lot of apprenticeship going on. You, the master, the master sifu, and say, when the day I die, I give you my final trick, and so on. So people were the key to learning. And then about 500 years ago, books came in and books changed things because now they said, you, you know, content is the key. And then universities came and said, it's all about content, content, content. And then the internet came and said, look, let's take content to the X number. But what happened is the more content, the less context, the less self-confidence, the less motivation, the less understanding of, of the times, the less alignment, right? And so we realized there was a big problem because we realized people need to be brought back because that's where tacit information, people connect and give tacit information. Content is important because content gives you skills, knowledge, understanding. Context gives you application of that knowledge. Now, all these things need to happen just in time because the world has changed where there's so many problems, there's so many things to learn. I cannot learn everything. So I need to learn whatever I need to do at the right time, at the right place. That means today I have this problem, today I need to learn something to solve this problem. And so how do we solve this problem, right? And then the second problem we had was engagement. It's the same thing. People want live on-demand engagement. We don't want to have surveys and six months later, somebody comes back and tells me, here's the answer to the survey. We want things live. We want things on-demand. We want a reaction from our manager now. We want to understand what's happening in our company now. We want to know uh, uh, what the data tells us now. We want to know our feedback from our performance now. Everything has to be now, right? And so we say, hey, we've got, we got two very interesting things to solve. We've got a problem of learning which needs to be just in time. And we've got a problem of engagement, which also needs to be just in time, right? 
Um, so, so you know, I, 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 I wanted to, you know, just jump, jump back to, to uh, um, this engagement piece. And so, how do we solve this problem? And so, we started to say, you know, we need to look at our business differently because last time, leadership development is all about activity. I do coaching, I do interventions, I do uh, training, I do workshops, and so on. You got to get out of that, and we need to start building what we call two things. We need to build long-term rituals or long-term, long-term transactions. And we need to build infrastructure to house those transactions. So this, these two things was how we need to build the future for us to get to just-in-time learning, for us to get to just-in-time engagement, for us to build 21st century HR and infrastructure, right? And so that's what we did with our organization. We brought our company to two. You know, we had a platform organization called Leadermix Digital, and we've got a transaction or a repeatable, consistent uh, rituals um, uh, business called Leadermix Corporate, right? And so that's that's kind of how we sought, and then ultimately it, it came to a point where we uh, sort of sort of uh, became um, what it is today, right? Where we have an infrastructure, we have interventions, and ultimately we have some support services that that sort of play in between. Um, and you see, you know, I, I mean, for everyone who's used Nikko, it's unbelievable, right? But there's also happily Budaya, you know, it's unbelievable uh, apps, and there's also Tacit, right? It's to bring people back, right? But you can you can eliminate the process. To things like mental cloud and, and 360 feedback and, and trades, but the people need to be at the center of tacit information movement, right? So you need to bring people back, right? You need to bring people back. You need to bring context back and you need to bring content, right? So you need a combination of all three, right? Um, and that's kind of how we started to refocus ourselves. And we looked at a platform, we looked at apps and systems, but we also looked at content. And ultimately, it's the combination of all three that makes us a powerful entity, you know, and 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 having all these things like Nicole and 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 Mentor Cloud and 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 and, and other other great uh, apps uh, to drive L and D. Now, so as you as you start to think about, and I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up, and you know, uh, uh, we'll, we'll go into a short time of uh, uh, questions if there's any. If not, um, you know, I got some uh, cool videos to show you. I just wanna, you know, as as and 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 as we talk a little bit about some of these platforms and so on, I just wanna share three pieces of advice. Um, to all of you and go from there, right? And feel free to ask uh, uh, questions. So before I get to advice, I see a question coming, given companies' current financial study, how important is for companies to allocate budgets for talent management through digital learning tools? And what is the good ratio for budget allocation? Thanks for the question, Divya. Um, I don't think there's a proper number, right? But I think as a overall, you know, if you think about growth of your employees, empower, you, you, you know, most companies look at between one to 5% of, you know, the payroll or, or essentially revenue sometimes to say, look, how do we set aside some funds for employee development, for employee engagement, for employee growth, for, for us to connect uh, key messages for alignment, you know, alignment is so important, right? Um, so there's no hard and fast rule, but I think as you think of 2022, you should be, if you don't have technology, if you don't have things like Nicole and Happily uh, embedded in your organization, you know, you should be really thinking about putting aside some funds to say, how do I get these things embedded in your organization? Now, um, let me get to these uh, short little advice that I want to give uh, HR. So I, I, I mean, it goes back to this. Uh, you got you to gotta make sure things are contextual. You got to align your learning engagement strategies and projects to your business imperatives. You need, firstly, you need to understand business strategy. Um, you need to understand business. You need to, but the other thing is you need to make sure you focus on self-confidence and you need to make sure you understand how each employee is different. Everyone is different. We are all different and we're all unique. It's a 21st century. We can do mass customization. Learning can be mass customized. In fact, you know, things like, like Nicole, right? Enable you to have AI do the teaching, right? So there's so much customization there, right? I, I think the, the second thing is if you are not leveraging technology in your learning engagement, you are going to be building, you're continuing to build a 20th century organization. You're not building a 21st century organization. You got to be thinking about technology in all your HR, right? How, you know, how do you get intelligence? Because you, as a HR leader, your goal is to be an intelligence. You, employee intelligence is your prerogative, is your ownership, right? And, and remember, technology actually is very productive. It helps you to stop wasting time and getting you to the heart of the matter, right? Um, so, so think about, think about I mean, again, you know, Nicole Budaya, all these proven apps, right? Um, leverage it to scale your presence because you need to be present. As a HR leader, even if you have one person for 100 people, it doesn't matter. You can scale your presence by 
using technology, right? And I do that, right? I mean, we, 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 especially with Happy, right? I'm, I'm scaling my presence on a daily basis to all my direct reports, even though I may have many of them, right? Because I'm able to do that through technology. And the last piece is you need to focus a lot on rewards and recognition, right? In 2022, right? I think the game is going to be about rewards and recognition. People learn and perform when they are motivated. How do you institutionalize rewards and recognition? And you can do that, right? Of course, with technology, because people do something good, automatically the technology rewards them with, with here's a voucher from Grab, or here's a, okay, don't use Grab, use Food Panda. Um, yes, <laughs> I don't like Grab. Uh, so here's, here's, here's this, here's that, and so on and so forth, right? So there is, there is a way to institutionalize and automate rewards and recognition, right? And, and of course, you know, you can use that, uh, you know, Budaya, you can use that happily. I mean, there's a lot of different tools that enable you to do that, right? Um, and ultimately, right, you got to build rituals that drive the right behaving culture that support your business. What are the rituals that you have? And many times our rituals are negating rituals. We have rituals in our organization that actually are bad for our organization, right? And so how do we negate some of these issues, right? Um, so, so let me let me take a couple more questions um, from there, and then and then and then uh, we'll, we'll see where this goes. As many companies realize the importance of ensuring employee well-being to the planet, what is the next tip? What is the tip for HR to do better for this year? I, I think these three tips are very critical. Eva, um, you got to think contextual. You got to focus on learning. Issue. You got to look at technology. If you're not, it's the it's a it's a very different world. I mean, you know, I, I think this is the seventh sense, right? HR needs a sense. You know, Nietzsche talks about the sixth sense. I, I shared that. That was the 1890s. I think today, you know, Joshua uh, Cooper Ramo will tell you about the seven sense. Right? The seven sense is ability to understand networks, to understand how things are working today. How do you play in this new world, right? Um, how do you sort of leverage technology? How do you embed it for learning, engagement, for rewards and recognition, right? It's 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 there, right? The technology is there, um, and it's cheaper. It's much cheaper than hiring more people, right? Uh, it is so much cheaper than 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 scaling up through people. And then you get wise investment in people, right? Um, so, so, so those, those would be my my sort of tips. As um, uh, so, I, I think the, both are the same questions. Okay, it's the, I, I I think Eva has asked the same question twice. Um, no worry. So, so with that, all right. I I don't know if there's any other questions from any of you, but I want to show um, a short uh, a short little video. Uh, I think if you have not yet uh, sort of leveraged. Um, uh, this, you know, in terms of learning and engagement for yourself, um, I would highly, highly recommend that you look at, um, at, 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 at these three different levels, you know, contextualization, engagement, and, and rewards. And, you know, uh, again, you know, just to, just to share, I mean, if you haven't um, really explored, like, for example, a learning management system for your organization, it's, it's probably, um, you know, a, a, uh, uh, moving away, I mean, the world is moving away from LMS to what we call learning experience platform. You know, you should uh, check out what, what Nicole is doing, check out what Mental Cloud is doing, um, check out what Happily or Budaya, you know, it's another great uh, app. Um, and maybe what we can do very quickly um, is maybe I, I'll just, just get our, our producer to share um, uh, a quick little um, 30 seconds spiel uh, on Nicole, if you haven't seen Nicole. So, you know, um, just, just just check this out. I mean, if you have not uh, heard about Nicole, um, you definitely need uh, to check out Nicole. So let's, let's uh, watch this very quick little trailer. Welcome back, and um, I would highly recommend you know, if you haven't checked out Nicole or Budaya, um, you know, go out to budaya.app or nicole.app or nicole.tech and, and check out uh, those things. Um, so you you can truly empower your employees. So I wish you all the best for 2022 um, as you start thinking about 2022, as you start planning for 2022, as you start uh, navigating. You know, think think of those three things. Think of the contextualization. Make sure there's alignment to your business strategy. Think about technology. Leverage it fully for your learning, for your engagement, for your rewards and recognition, for your programs that you want to pull. 
technology has to be the key. You've got to get your employees into the 21st century. You know, we cannot be sitting in an era that we don't embed the physical and digital. Everything's going to be embedded. You know, it's, it's, it's really a new network, right? I mean, you talk about highways and infrastructure of the last century. This century is going to be a century of networks. How do you build the right networks and these digital networks, right, uh, that are going to make total sense, whether it's networks with your customers, whether it's networks uh, across the board. Um, so with that, I, I, you know, if there's no more questions, um, you can check out, um, uh, you can email learn at leadromics.com. You can get a personalized uh, consulting session on Nicole or Happily or Budaya. Um, you know, you can also check out some of our videos on Leadromics Media. If you go to YouTube, type Leadromics Media. There's some great ones. Uh, Lee Lung Nian, the CEO of Citibank, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a great dialogue in terms of the future of HR. Uh, and where that's moving, you can check out that video on the on the on the link below. Um, so there's many many great uh, ways to check it out. I wish you all the best, and with that, you know, I will leave you guys um, to have a fabulous year end. The last six weeks of the year, um, you know, let's close this year out fantastically, and let's uh, make sure we do the planning right, and let's get 2022 to be an amazing, awesome year. I wish you all the best in your. 22, 22, 2022 planning and your year ahead. Have a great one, everybody. Uh, goodbye. And we will sh end with a very short little video. Uh, goodbye for now. Take care, everyone.